shift in civil rights and criminal justice? I mean, I think I'm, I'm schooled as a human rights person, and so at the root of everything in human rights is the dignity of a person and protecting the dignity of that person. And that can be um, a range of things like making sure that you're not over police, that you're not thrown in a cage. Um, but it also can be something um, that we don't talk about enough in our country, but was originally part of the civil rights movement, which is this idea of economic and social rights. What is it for people to have access to health, to live in healthy communities, to have access to education, a right to clean water, all these things that we don't necessarily think of. And so when I think about the civil rights vision, it's not just how do we protect the rights and dignity of each person, how do we make sure these horrible things stop, but how do we create a world, and I, again, I have three little kids, so my mind is always going to them, is like, how do we create a world in which our kids get to live out their dreams, right? So what does that look like? If they, you know, at LCCR we work on education, making sure that people aren't over-disciplined and kept out of school and kept away from opportunity. And actually, um, one of the public defenders, Jackie Wilson, um, we did an event not too long ago, and he said, every minute that a kid sits in a classroom is a minute that they're closer to their dreams. And I think that's the world we want to create. I think at the, at the, at the you know, million foot level, that's what we all want. It doesn't matter, you know, who we're talking to. At the end of the day, we want to raise, uh, we want our kids or our community for everyone to live their full potential and dream. Um, and then there's a lot of sort of <laughs> to do's and that um, to get there. But at the, at the top level, that's, that's um, I think, I think what many of us are striving for. Um, this question is for both of you, but I'm going to start with you, Mano. Are there any hidden issues that women and LGBTQ clients experience when encountering the, the justice system? And if so, what are, what are those issues? Well, as far as um, LGBTQ um, people who are in the system, one just very basic issue is you know, safety in the jails. You know, and that's, it's the uh, classification in housing isn't just based on self based on self-identification, which, which it should be. Um, but I think broad, so which brings us to the broader issue of why are so many people incarcerated to begin with, and we can get into bail reform and all those issues, because the number of people uh, who are kept in county jail can be far less than it currently is. But I think a bigger issue when we talk about people in this system is to not only look at the individual themselves. Our system is very based on trying to attribute action by one individual and then what should be the impact on the individual. But the reality is every individual in the system is part of a broader community. And I think before a judge sentences someone, they should have to acknowledge this. What I'm sentencing you to, whether it's 30 days, 60 days, three years, I'm consciously also making sure, making it such that the other caretaker at home, whether it's a parent or a mother, has to now do more to take care of that child, they, to more, more responsibilities. And just a very simple example, um, you know, I have a client I'm representing, and when for, to make, for his family to appear to court date, his mother has to take all the kids out of the school, take a day off from work, drive all the way from Antioch to San Francisco, and drive back, and it's a spillover effect of that, of you know, that child missing that day of school, that that uh, grandmother missing that work which she desperately needs because she's living paycheck to paycheck, all that just to make one court appearance when if that person was not in on high bail, you know, he might be fighting his case from the outside and all those residual effects wouldn't be there. And that's just for one day. You can imagine what the impact is we're talking about in weeks, months, or years. Can I add to that as well? Um, Danica Rodmel in our office um, shared a great article with me by Joshua Lodge. Page. Page. Um, that talked about the financial uh, predatory nature of our system. Um, we do a lot of work on consumer bail and um, helping families uh, release the debt that they've carried because they've had to sign um, contracts with bail bond companies. Um, the bail bond companies are always looking for a woman to co sign, um, the caretakers in the family. Um, who's paying for the cost of the phone call? Who's making the visits um, when folks are incarcerated? Um, it is that, that extra burden, and so I think that's really important, and that's something that we talk about a lot across our organizations, is that we're not dealing with just the harm to one individual. We're really, we all need to be thinking about what community we're living in and what the impact is on the entire community 
um, the resources of that community, the wealth of that community, the heart of that community. So, I want to yeah. stay on this topic of bail for a moment because no doubt everyone in this room or most folks in this room have read recent articles that there is a, a movement to eradicate money bail. Tell us a little bit, what, what is bail? And why do, why do we think we need it? And tell us what the, what the path forward is. Well, I, I think it, it's traditionally been, you know, there's a bail industry that makes a lot of money on this, and it's been, the, it's been traditionally the logic here that, you know, you're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty, presumption of innocence, but this reverses that presumption unless you have money. If you have money, if you can pay the bail, then you are innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, but, but if not, you have to sit in jail. And the perverse impact of that is, Every single day across this country, at the initial arraignment, there are district attorneys arguing this person is a danger to the community, this person's a flight risk, they need to stay in custody. And then, whether it's nine days later or whenever it comes to, comes up for the next hearing, you see time and time again district attorneys saying, You can go home now. Just plead guilty, plead to this felony, waive all your rights. And all of a sudden, that you know, danger to the community, that flight risk, goes away. But that person now has a conviction, and oftentimes, you know, with overcharging, it can be, you know, it can be a strike to go home today. It can be a felony. It can be a serious charge. And all the work that we want to do to actually sort out what happened through cross examination, through filing motions, it just goes out the door. And that's the uh, perverse and really, really uh, detrimental impact of bail and people being locked up despite there being a presumption of innocence. And the average cost of the average bail amount is $50,000. Um, and so even if you aren't charged um, and you've gone to the bond company, um, you're still on the hook for a premium, um, even if all charges are dropped. So it's, a, it's, it's in addition to all of the things that we're talking about here, it's long-term devastating impact on a family and community. You mentioned earlier, Monica, the work that you do at the Lawyers Committee, you mentioned that you do work on immigration. Can you tell us a bit about what kinds of civil rights work you're doing with immigrant clients? Sure, um, we have been doing asylum work for over 35 years. Um, that work has gotten much, much harder. Um, we do individual representation case. Right now, every single case we see is an impact case because um, every protection that we've had is at risk. Um, the protections that our, our clients are facing, um, again, as I said, weekly is being stripped away. Um, then we look at what are the larger systemic issues that we can fight through larger impact litigation. We have two major um, cases right now, one on detention conditions that actually predates to 2015. Um, we had a number of clients come through the Arizona um, Customs and Border Patrol um, detention facilities there. All of the things that we saw, in fact, there were uh, pictures from our case that came out on the news when you were looking at folks that had inadequate, um, just basic sanitary um, protection, basic bedding, there wasn't any, um, being fed at three in the morning, things like that, so we're working on that. Um, and we also have been fighting, uh, and is it public, can I say this? I can't say this. Um, we just settled a case a couple of weeks ago on behalf of unaccompanied minors, abused and neglected. Um, children who had protection up until the age of 21 and then a pathway um, to a green card here and um, arbitrarily the administration shockingly um, decided to cut that off at 18 and all of a sudden we had this class we had kept having clients come in and we had nothing we could do for them so we filed a class action suit we just settled last week um, to protect uh, this class of children um, 18 to 21 year olds who will um, are protected from deportation now, not just in what they've, uh, the administration policy change, but also in future changes that might be coming. Um, and there are about five other states around the country who are working on similar cases. So we're hoping, I mean, part of what we're doing right now at Lawyers Committee is we're, we're very locally focused, um, but we're looking at things that can help set precedent because there are things that we can, you know, uh, move forward in California that can helpfully um, be supportive to other jurisdictions Speaking of young people, we've got two questions from the audience um, about juveniles. I'll read them both um, since they're about the same population. One says, uh, with the closure of Juvenile Hall, 
what's the number one thing or service that we'll need to prioritize? And the second one says, um, in the juvenile justice system, when a youth gets taken in, the intake officer uses a risk assessment instrument to determine if they'll be released or taken into custody. Will your office, I'm assuming that means your office, uh, request the RAI source from something I can't read here, department and hold them accountable. I mean, I think that what we, we do need to continually, we don't want a money bail system, but at the same time, we need to continually evaluate what this algorithm is gonna be, just to make sure they're not asking questions that indirectly, you know, uh, have implicit or explicit biases, so that we actually get just results on whatever, whatever um, algorithm is being used to determine uh, someone's uh, risk in terms of releasing them. The um, first question, I think what we need is, Uh, and then if we close juvenile okay. hall, what's, what, what, what do we need for young people? What do we need to prioritize for them? I think we just need to prioritize care if we close juvenile hall. It's very simple. I think that there are studies that show that if there are um, you know, five adults in a young person's life that you know, truly care about them from wherever, they're, wherever those adults are coming from, that there's you know, almost unlimited potential for what a young person can accomplish. And I don't think there's any reason one of those adults can't be someone in our office, whether it's a social worker, an attorney, an investigator, a paralegal, uh, one of our clerks, anyone in our office. But there's also other people in the system, other mentors, other people from CBOs who could be that person. What I, one thing I don't like is when some, one of our staff or I heard a defense attorney say, you know, stay out of trouble. And the reason for that is that's a very low goal, you know, staying out of trouble. Uh, you know, people, we should be trying to encourage people to do much more than it, you know, aspire to just stay out of trouble. And I've seen, you know, people charged, you know, uh, young people, teenagers charged with the most serious offenses, something for which, I mean, I represented someone who was charged in adult court and the district attorney was offering, uh, I mean, they weren't offering anything, they wanted a life sentence. And we did the trial, the client was acquitted in about, 90 minutes after a three month trial. And you know, I know this young person has unlimited potential. So I think um, you know, that answer is gonna be on a case by case basis, but I think you're gonna know once you meet the young person. You mentioned burnout earlier. Will you talk a little bit about the personal cost to do this work? Um, I'll ask you this too when you sit down. I, I think it's um, hard, as I said, in, in the human rights world, we've studied it a bit. A friend of mine at NYU just put out a study that uh, recently that said that 19% of human rights workers um, in organizations around the world and in the United States, of the 19% had PTSD signs. I mean, actual, like, you could get a clinical diagnosis, and that another 19 had such significant signs that wouldn't be a diagnosis, but had enough indicators. And so we haven't done that. Um, so I don't, I'm not aware of a similar study within the US, but I think it came at so many of us as such a shock um, that the world sort of changed in 2016. Um, and the rate of, of, again, we've got clients and community that we care about um, where the protections that they have are stripped away every day. Um, the climate that we're living in, and it's not just our clients, a lot of us, a lot of folks that work in this work, um, uh, our doctor was recipients, have undocumented family members, are many of us people of color, um, who are uh, feeling the assault at this time. And so I think, um, and, and the flip side of that, which I think is important too, is that this is a gift. Those of us who put our heart and soul into this work and see in our clients and the folks that come in our doors, um, a real connection to us and our loved ones, and if we treat them like family, um, it's a gift. And so we just have to think about how we're gonna solve for that. And we don't have the answers yet in the nonprofit world. I've had, at various times, severe vicarious trauma and PTSD symptoms, and I've, quite frankly, been pretty burnt out over the last several months. Um, and we just have to figure out how to solve for that, whether that is, um, I think, you know, I love, I've been in DC for so long, I love being in the Bay Area where we talk about vicarious trauma, we bring in trainers, um, and that's fine, but we also need to bring in actual support for us um, and to think about 
ways in which we're maybe doing our work differently, um, different ways that we're supporting our client community and the folks that are on the front line. So I think the answer is that this takes a huge toll, not only on us, but then our families. I'm looking at um, Leonard's partner here. Um, Asha, and it does, we, we often will take our stress out when we come home um, and on our, on our friends and our, our loved ones. And so um, I think it's something that we need to continue having conversations around. I think if we do hold it as a gift, that we do this work with our heart and soul, um, and we hold healing as central to all of the work that we're doing, and it's a constant thing that we're working on, um, we actually can really evolve the entire um, social justice community. 